Thank you very much, Professor Bendel. It's really a delight to um, be here. In a way, I feel like I'm in two places uh, at the time. The city of uh, Erlangen and here at the university, which is so known for its track record in the field of human rights and for the Human Rights Center and for the wonderful research that's done and for the very good students it has. And then also in uh, the city of Nuremberg, which of course has really uh, for many, many years uh, manifested itself and worked on the idea of being a human rights city. And when I was flying here this morning, I was thinking about how many markers in the field of international law are actually named after cities. You have the Nuremberg Charter, you have the Treaty of Maastricht, you have the San Francisco Charter, um, there's many other examples. And the, the, the Treaty of Utrecht, I didn't want to be um, too much uh, patriotic in that regard now that we're not at the uh, World Championship. No, I won't talk about the World Championship here. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, Treaty, Treaty of Utrecht is also a very good uh, example. Yet, as um, Marcus Kajewski very uh, rightfully mentioned, when we think about international law, when we think about human rights, we always focus on states. And I think a key thread in my presentation today will be the need to really think through the role of cities in furthering and implementing um, international human rights law, also from a legal perspective. Well, the occasion for talking about this has, I think, already very well been set out by my um, predecessors. Um, I, too, was struck by the example of the Aquarius um, a few weeks ago and by the contrast between the Italian position and that of a number of, of cities. One of those cities was Barcelona. Here you see the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau, who stands here at the opening of a shame counter. I don't know if anyone has uh, seen this in Barcelona. In Barcelona they have a, you can say it's a work of art, you can say it's a digital manifest, but they have a, um, a statue that counts the amount of people who died uh, crossing the Mediterranean in, uh, in the current year. And in a way, this is a reminder to the people of Barcelona of the drama happening as we speak on the Mediterranean, but also of what is felt as a urban responsibility to address the consequences of uh, migration. So this is one example, but you see examples like that all over the world. Another one which some of you might have been following is the rise of sanctuary cities in the United States. Again, you have the example of a national government that's becoming more and more conservative with very strict immigration policies. And this is coupled to a situation in which more and more cities, but also counties and also states in the US manifest them themselves as sanctuary cities. Now, in the US context, being a sanctuary city means that cities don't cooperate fully with um, um, the federal deportation uh, agency and that when they arrest someone, uh, they have the option of detaining that person for the person to be deported if it concerns an irregular migrant. And these are all cities, counties and states that refuse to do that. And in that sense also really decouple their local policies from national migration policies. Well, Another um, instance, a much broader one, was already hinted upon uh, by Markus Kajewski. It's the rise worldwide of human rights cities. A few years ago, um, we wrote a book about this with a number of colleagues. And 
I was personally struck by the amount of cities all over the world that somehow take international law, international human rights law, as a basis for their local policies. And this can be in the field of women's rights, it can be in the field of children's rights, it can be in the field of human rights generally, but you also increasingly see this in the field of migration and refugee rights. So for instance, the world Forum of Human Rights Cities, which meets in Guangyu later uh, this year, um, will really have as a theme the uh, refugee rights and the rights of migrants more generally. So the theme of today is indeed the um, role, the increasing role played by cities in refugee rights in particular, in human rights in general. And what I'd like to contribute to the discussion is first a bit of background on the topic, asking the question why we see this um, development happening, to then um, on the basis of our research up to now, theorize a bit on why it is that some cities are more welcoming than others, what are explanatory factors there, how do local settings matter, and I want to focus on a number of elements which I thought would be interesting for our dialogue today because um, they correspond so well with the really interesting research here. I'd then want to make the case that what we are seeing is not so much a local turn, but a global turn in a way, mixing the uh, global and the uh, local, and then return as uh, someone who combines a legal and a political science background, return to the role of international law and in these discussions. So that's the, uh, the agenda. But before turning to local settings, it might be good to briefly look at what aspects of refugee reception and integration we're actually talking about. And why it is that cities play such a uh, role there. Well, just briefly, the big picture, our world today, um, of course, there is the uh, influx of refugees in Europe, nowhere as large as in other parts of the world. I think it's always important to mention that. Um, outside of the EU, uh, in Turkey, there's three and a half million Syrians. Lebanon has seen its population double over the past years because of the war in Syria, in uh, Jordan, in Kenya. Um, there's an enormous amount of refugees, but also in Europe, we have witnessed a significant influx of people fleeing for their life. Um, at the same time, in terms of the political context, we see a rise of multi-level governance. This has also already been touched upon. Another aspect uh, brought to the fore by scholars like Benjamin Barber is, in a way, the inability of the nation state to address the big challenges of today. We talk about migration now, but the same goes for climate change. You see national politics increasingly deadlocked, unable to take um, real steps forward, and this is also part of the context. Another part of the political institutional context to look at, I think, is the rise of network societies, the fact that this idea of a world of nation states maybe was never a depiction of the reality, but is most definitely not a depiction of today's political reality. And at the same time, in thinking about cities, it seems important to understand the degree to which key competences in the fields we're talking about have been decentralized to local authorities all over Europe in the past decades. And of course, there's big differences between decentral uh, countries like Germany and centralist countries like the Netherlands. But this process of decentralization you've seen everywhere. 
So this is, I think, a cluster of background elements to take into account in understanding, in analyzing what we see happening. Another um, cluster of um, policy measures, wider tendencies that explain to a larger part a large extent what we see and why we see it um, has to do with neoliberalism, has to do with austerity politics and has to do with technocratization. If you look at a detailed level in what happens in cities and why it happens with refugees, um, there's always this big thing of neoliberalism uh, as an explanatory uh, factor. Now, another set of background tendencies, I think, to look at, to consider um, in understanding also why it is mayors that are uh, suddenly coming to the fore in thinking about migration is the rise of populism. And populism here, I mean the idea that it's very important to listen to the majority of the people, to follow the wishes of the majority. This also explains, I think, to a large extent, the measures we see in um, migration management these days. Another aspect is the rise of the personal in politics. I don't know what it was like in Germany 20 years ago and how it compares to today, but all over Europe you see a rise of um, the importance of mayors as individuals and to me this has everything to do with um, the fact that people in these volatile times, uncertain times, want individuals they can relate to and individuals can really impress upon local uh, politics. Um, symbolic politics also serve as background explanations and I think in and analyzing these developments, the role of social media is also something really important for us as researchers also to uh, take into account. So this in a way is the big canvas on which we see the rise of local authorities in refugee reception and integration. And what now are the particular domains in which you see um, cities taking a larger stance than before, um, differing from one another. Well, I've listed uh, some of them here, together with the Cities of Refuge uh, team. You see differences, for instance, in the field of reception. Again, this differs per country. Um, for instance, in Switzerland, cantons have a wide range of uh, competencies, really also in determining refugee uh, status. Um, but you see differences also, for instance, in the Netherlands, where there's some municipalities that, for instance, say we won't send people back to Afghanistan. It might be national policy, it might be the uh, policy of our um, immigration authorities, but we feel Afghanistan is not safe enough and we're um, not uh, doing everything we can to ensure people don't go back. So that's really in the field of status determination. You see differences in the field of housing, um, in the field of um, what is provided in terms of services for people. You see big differences in terms of, of education. For instance, the question um, as to whether someone who arrives in a given city can immediately start studying, start learning the language, or has to wait for status determination. Big differences between countries, but also big differences within countries throughout Europe. The same in the field of healthcare. Uh, the same if you look at psychological support. Over the past half year, we did research in the rural area in which I live, uh, called Zeeland, in the southwest of the Netherlands. And there you see the amount of uh, resources that people get 
to work with traumas, um, the degree to which uh, there are these type of services really differs from municipality to municipality. So there too you see differences. I know there's people here who are working on mobility, the freedom of movement. Again, there you see some municipalities who really uh, restrict people in uh, reception centers whilst they're waiting for status determination and others who have as a policy to mix people um, much more than that. And another in the reception uh, phase is whether people are allowed to work immediately or whether they have to wait for status, status determination. So in all these fields, you see cities differ from one another, even before someone who's applying for a, a refugee status receives that status. Well, of course, in the much more long-term, difficult, intricate process of integration, you also see big differences between cities, uh, whether it's about family reunification policies, uh, the type of housing that people get, whether people are really put together or spread out over a town, the quality of access to housing, quality of social services, education, the type of language courses. To give the example of the Netherlands, again, um, because of neoliberal thinking, because of uh, market thinking, integration and language acquisition in the Netherlands is considered the individual responsibility of refugees. This means that uh, people have to buy their own uh, courses, their own uh, language training, and the quality of what's offered really, really differs from one uh, municipality to, to another. So there you see big, uh, big differences. In the Netherlands, again, we now have something called a participation declaration that uh, people have to sign. There's courses for this. Municipalities have the competence to design courses. And this means that one municipality will focus on where do you put your garbage? How do you phone um, a doctor if you have a problem? And another municipality will really develop a course on Dutch values and what they entail. So also very big differences. You see the same in Denmark, for instance. Um, same in the field of labor markets, integration and naturalization. So there's a whole range of policy domains, often directly the competence of local authority, that really determine how someone uh, fleeing their country is welcome, is integrated, the quality of the process that's completely within the domain of local authorities and where local authorities throughout Europe really differ in uh, what they do. A key puzzle is, of course, why is it that they differ? Why is one city a city of refuge, if you want to um, label it that way. And why do other cities really find mayors standing on the barricades to keep people out? Well, of course, this is a big issue and a complex issue um, with an enormous amount of factors involved. And I won't go by all of them, but my colleague Timir Subchev has really set out the different uh, domains of explanation, if you wish, why cities diverge. Um, part of it is the institutional opportunity structure. Uh, in the, the project on mayors and migration uh, policies, you're going to look at the amount of autonomy that local authorities have. And of course, this is a key factor in explaining why some cities do much more than others. Also, if you compare countries to one another, um, there's policy opportunities. Um, politics play a big role. An interesting thing is that people always think, oh, left-wing cities are so much more open than more right-wing cities. Well, as an overarching finding, this is true, 
But there's also very notable exceptions. You have in Belgium, for instance, the city of Mechele, uh, which has a relatively right-wing mayor, someone who very much has a law and order agenda, very tough on crime, Bart Somers, but who always also has really opened up the city for refugees. So you do see exceptions to this political uh, thesis. Another aspect that I want to say a bit about uh, more later is the role of cities in, uh, in networks. So this is all in the field of institutional uh, opportunity structures. At the same time, in understanding why cities from diff differ from one another, it's really important to look at the complex of actors. When I started this project on cities of refuge, um, I had the concept of local governments in the research question and by now I've come to realize that you should not speak of local government, it's really local governance, it's about the complex of actors, it's about civil society, it's about businesses being involved. There's interesting examples like uh, Milan and Torino in uh, Italy where the involvement of big business really explains why the city is relatively welcoming and there's also a key role for individuals that's something i want to focus on a bit more later in looking at other say background variables there's a host of research more from geography from uh, urban studies that points out that of course the wealth of a city matters. It's much easier to be welcoming if you have a lot of funds to do that. Um, the labor market conditions matter. If you really need people to work in your companies, then you'll often find big business also on your side in uh, being welcoming. Um, the housing market matters. It can be that um, if there's all these empty buildings, it might be really attractive to fill them with people seeking a housing. You see this a lot in Italy, you see it in rural areas in the Scandinavian countries, you see it in rural areas in the Netherlands. Um, and of course, the availability of services is also an explanatory factor there. Another aspect that doesn't get that much attention in the literature, but that I also want to say something about a bit later is the role of, of discourse and narratives and the way in which the need to be welcoming or the need to not be as welcoming is phrased discursively because I think it's really important in Europe today and um, not looked at as much as uh, I think is uh, necessary. First city networks, I won't say much about that, uh, apart from the fact that I'm really looking forward to learning about the uh, results of the, uh, of, of, of the project. Um, in looking in our project on cities and refugees, one of the things we came to realize is how being in a network makes a difference for a city in terms of getting in funding, in terms of uh, other aspects that I'll touch upon uh, later. We did an analysis of these city networks in Europe, a bit different because we looked at networks of which European cities were part, so also more international networks, um, also the Council of Europe. There, there you see that you have um, 27 networks which comply with this definition and um, um, that in a way there's a lot of overlap. There are cities that are a member of a lot of different networks. So for instance, Barcelona uh, is a member of nine of these 27 uh, networks, which also makes for interesting theorizing. Why is it that there's a need for all these different networks? What does that uh, mean? But networks are clearly a key issue to focus on, which is, I think, why it's so good that this project is starting here. In our analysis of what these networks are, what they do, uh, we distinguished a number of functions. Um, one is simply sharing information. Um, how do you house people? How do you make sure that 
people who lived in town already don't feel left out, um, exchange of best practices. Another key function already mentioned is looking for international support, funding, um, European projects, international projects, but also recognition of what cities do. Another, and this is very much the narrative component again, is about testing which narratives, which stories about refugees work best, also politically. I remember interviewing a uh, elder woman in uh, Antwerp who very much has a human rights background and she said to me well if I start talking about human rights in our municipal council I won't get anywhere in terms of refugee uh, reception I really have to find a story that connects um, to the history of Antwerp that connects to the economic agenda and these types of stories is also stories that travel between, uh, between cities. Another key function is setting standards, agreeing on um, joint standards. You have, for instance, the European Coalition of uh, Cities Against Racism, ECAR. Uh, they have a 10-point plan which you commit to as a city. And once you commit to it, you also keep to um, following those, uh, those standards. If you look at what city networks do, it's also very much about showing what, um, what is done in cities, showcasing in a way. Um, more cynical people speak about city branding. This is very much there in what cities do. Manifesting a city as a cosmopolitan um, city also in the international plane for a wide variety of reasons. And another aspect uh, very much related to what we were discussing before is this idea of also teaming up with cities transnationally, with international actors to shame governments and to point out that there are alternatives to more restrictive um, national governmental policies. And if you look at all these functions, and I'll come back to that later, you can say that these transnational networks in a way are really global networks. They serve to translate global norms to the local, to help develop global norms, and this is how they work in the field of refugee reception and integration. Okay, so this is one um, aspect to look at and very much the agenda here in uh, Erlangen for the coming uh, years. And I'm really, I'll be really interested to read what comes out and to discuss what comes out. As said, one of the things I've come to realize in studying what happens in different municipalities is that you can't speak about government uh, alone. You have to speak about governance and in a way that this idea of a local turn could also be misleading because of the multi-level context in which these processes take place. I mean the fact that in Italy in status determination you have a committee that sits in a locality, but that has someone of the municipality, that has someone of the UNHCR, that has someone of the Prefettura, which is very much the uh, central agency uh, locally, and an expert, and that this joint committee decides whether you get a refugee status or not. How, how to make sense of that without taking into account this governance assemblage, if you wish, involved in these, uh, in these processes. So I think this is very much also for us trying to understand what cities do, why they do it, um, something to keep in mind. One of the things that I find really um, interesting and why I look forward to also the uh, mayor's speech a bit later is the role of individuals. If you look at why 
one city does so much more than others and you really start asking and looking around, um, you often end up with one person. You end up with one very enthusiastic civil servant, you end up with a university professor, you end up uh, with an active mayor, you end up with someone in civil society. Often you end up with a combination of those people who know each other. Um, but it's often really um, the work of individuals that makes why one city is a really good place to arrive and why another city is much less uh, welcoming. And I've pasted here just one example uh, quoted within the Eurocities context. But to me, that example stands for the um, role of individuals in these large and to some extent also intractable processes. Okay, so that's about the uh, actor setting, if you wish. As said, I feel it's also really important to look at discourses, discourses of reception, discourses of integration. Um, our colleague Sarah Millet has just written a really interesting paper about, uh, with as a title, Burden or Benefit, Duty or Gift, in which she analyzes the types of discourses pertaining to refugee reception and integration. And if you um, look at these discourses, you see that they switch over time, they are very different. Uh, you have very negative discourses. For instance, um, in Italy, increasingly you see the arrival of migrants framed as a health risk. So this is like people are coming here and they can be carrying all kinds of diseases with them. And this is why we as a city uh, shouldn't take them in. So really um, a public health kind of uh, narrative. On the other hand, um, you have narratives relating to tradition, which go both ways. So on the one hand, it can be like, look, we are um, uh, Bavarian or we're Frisian or uh, we're Danish or even a sub-national identity. And this is our identity and people simply don't fit in here. On the other hand, um, you see very powerful narratives which go back to the city history. So for instance, uh, Mechelen again, this mayor of Mechelen really describes how Mechelen was uh, the first place to have a high court for the whole region, also the Netherlands and what's now, what's now the Netherlands and what's now France. Um, how there's this tra tradition of international law, if you wish, in uh, Mechelen. How Mechelen also has a black page in its history because it was the place where Jews were deported during the war. And how because of this tradition, it's important to uh, receive people. And of course, this is very much what you see in Nuremberg as well, this relating to the tradition of a town, which is a very powerful narrative, and at times even more powerful than saying, well, these are people, they have rights, we signed uh, and ratified the UN um, Convention on the Rights of Refugees uh, and a whole host of human rights uh, conventions. Sometimes framing things in terms of tradition works better, but of course every type of discourse also has a um, trade-off to it. For instance, what you see a lot also all over Europe is the emphasis on the economic value of refugees. Like we have jobs, we need people to work here. Many people are highly educated. Um, they should be integrated into our labor market. Um, well, this is a discourse that works to some extent. At the same time, how do you then relate to people who are too old or too disabled or 
illiterate and cannot work? Do they then not benefit from um, the welcoming attitude? So looking at discourses and critically analyzing them, I think is also an important part of understanding what cities do and why cities do it. Anyway, so this is a big um, tour d'horizon on um, explaining what cities do, why they do it. I said I'd like to zoom in on this idea of uh, glocalism and glocal developments. So as an interim co conclusion, I think we can say that uh, local authorities are more and more taking a role in both creating human rights, really talking along at the uh, international level, but also very much in realizing uh, refugee rights and uh, human rights more generally. Human rights can be invoked in these processes, sometimes legally, sometimes discursively, sometimes just by cities complying with international human rights obligations. But a kind of legal puzzle that I wanted to put to this audience, just because I'd be really interested in your thoughts on it, is what in this context do we see as the formal autonomous position of cities in realizing international human rights law. And let me first explain why I think this is important to think about. Um, it's already been mentioned uh, a number of times that in the perception of international lawyers, international law is a state affair. States are actors in international law. Um, they close, uh, they enter into uh, obligations uh, in a contractual way. These are human rights covenants and how they then organize things nationally is really very much a state affair and not something that is of concern to international law. But what we see in happening increasingly is a situation where local authorities decouple their local policies from national policies and invoke international legal obligations to do so. You see this in refugee reception, but you also see this where it concerns irregular migrants. And that's an example that I'd like to put on the table. Um, of course, there's a big difference between people seeking refuge, people uh, receiving refugee status, and people who, for instance, flee their country and are not recognized as refugees under the Refugee Convention. Let me describe the puzzle by um, focusing on a Dutch case. The Dutch case is that of undocumented migrants in uh, the Netherlands, where we for um, a number of years now, since 2012, have a government that has as a formal position that people who've applied for refugee status and have been declined such status do not have the right to, for instance, emergency shelter. So the idea is people should leave the country um, and shouldn't be given any form of um, assistance apart from primary education and um, um, emergency health care, but definitely not shelter. Um, of course, we all know that there is a group of people who might formally have to leave, but who can't go back to their own country because their own country doesn't want them back, because uh, psychologically they can't do it, because um, they don't have uh, their stateless, they don't have a passport. There's many reasons why people feel compelled to stay in a, an arrival country and also in a given, given city. And because mayors and cities are much closer to this problem, you've seen cities over the Netherlands saying, well, we are going to provide what's called bed, bad, brood in the Netherlands, bed, bath and bread. We're going to provide emergency shelter to um, these migrants. 
Well, this is a um, very much a politicized issue. Um, the need for uh, the Dutch government to do this was taken up to uh, Strasbourg, to the uh, committee looking into the implementation of the European um, Social Charter. And this Strasbourg committee said, well, um, the Netherlands has to do this. And if the state of the Netherlands doesn't do it, cities have to, uh, have to uh, do it. Um, at the same time, for instance, a number of UN special rapporteurs also uh, made similar uh, comments. So they said there's an international human rights obligation to provide these people with shelter. Well, the Dutch state says, well, we're not going to do it. Uh, we see things differently. But what you see now is local authorities like Utrecht, like Amsterdam, like Rotterdam, like Groningen, invoking international human rights law and saying, well, we are complying with international human rights law and doing what uh, Strasbourg and the UN want us to do. So you, in a way, have local authorities invoking international law vis-a-vis -vis national states. And I think this is the reason why it's worthwhile to also think about these processes legally. Clearly, this is very much um, um, a developing discussion, definitely in the field of, uh, of international uh, law. But what you see in international human rights law, for instance, um, is that there's increased interest in this theme. So the, United, the UN uh, Human Rights Council has asked for a report on this uh, issue and adopted that report in 2015 on the human rights obligations of local authorities. Um, there will be a, a continued discussion on this and possibly even the, the guidelines presented at the UN General Assembly and at the next uh, Human Rights Council uh, meeting. And in the interim, what you see is, for instance, a lot of UN special rapporteurs really speaking directly to cities on their obligations, for instance, for the right to housing, which is clearly um, often a local government competency. You see the same within the context of UN habitats, um, where, again, um, cities are very active also in talking along, in lobbying also for the development of standards, for instance, a standard like the, uh, like the right to the city. Um, if you look at Europe, not so much in the sense of the EU, but in the sense of the Council of Europe, um, you see that the uh, Congress of Local and Regional Authorities has been really active again in the past years in um, explicating the responsibilities of local authorities. and um, also in developing indicators, human rights indicators for local authorities. So they've recently issued a, um, a report in this, uh, in this field. Finally, um, if you talk about the EU, of course, this is a very different legal order, but here too, one could argue on the basis of EU law um, that there is an autonomous obligation, even stronger than, than in international law, for local authorities to comply directly with EU directives. Those of you with an interest in EU law will know about the Costanzo obligation and the obligation of uh, local authorities to comply with EU directives even if national governments don't do so. Um, and this arguably also applies to directives like the Qualifications Directive, like the Returns Directive, like EU law that sets out the fundamental rights of refugees and migrants. Well, again, this is a field that's very much in development. I'm really thrilled that the International Law Association has now set up a committee to look into the responsibilities of, um, of cities in, in this field and has started thinking about what it means to not only see 
cities as kind of actors in this uh, black box of the state, but to also see them as actors in their own right. Of course, there's very big normative questions involved, because how do you normatively evaluate the fact that one city might be much more welcoming than another, might take obligations much more seriously than, uh, than another? One thing there is um, to say about this, and, and this is something Moritz Baumgärtel and I argue in an article that's coming out in the European Journal of International Law this summer, is that the involvement of cities also adds legitimacy to the field of international human rights law, which is very much uh, questioned because of this idea of being top down in positions from uh, Geneva and from New York. The moment that you have cities really um, taking up responsibilities in this field, this also adds to both legitimacy and both to the realization of human rights law. So anyway, that's the legal puzzle that I wanted to put to you. It's a puzzle that shows, again, the global dimensions of the process. It's a puzzle that I haven't solved yet, which is why I um, thought I'll put it to the human rights minds in uh, Erlangen. But to just uh, conclude the main points that I wanted to share with you today. Um, I think it's safe to say that um, you see all over Europe and also in other parts of the world a rise of local authorities in realizing refugee rights. Um, this can be explained by a number of, of factors. City networks are very important, individuals are uh, very important, discourses are important in the, uh, in the research, but that also from the perspective of law, it is um, important to really think through the role of cities in the field of international law and the relevance of constitutional dispensations in what cities do and uh, cannot do. So with these thoughts, I'd like to thank you for your attention, in spite of uh, all the sound uh, outside. And I really look forward to discussing these themes with all of you. Thank you.